the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Because we serve a God who is real. Mm. I had that song in my spirit, so I let the spirit go through my finger. <laughs> Just every now and then, it's good to go back. Yeah. <clears throat> and remember those hymns of even as we, as a church, prepare to celebrate 117 years of existence, there were songs that brought those upon whose shoulders we stand, there, there are those songs that brought them through. And those same songs, even though some people might think they're not relevant today, when we look at the meaning of those songs, not the age of the song, but the meaning of the song. We feel the spirit that is in that song. Then it doesn't matter how old the song is. As long as we're giving God the praise. So we are again blessed to be found in the house of prayer one more time. We're grateful for those of you who are joining us here in the sanctuary as well as those who are joining us virtually. As always, it is our prayer that God is continuing to shower his richest blessings upon you. So now we will begin our worship with prayer. Anybody? watching over us all day, leading us to a brand new day that we've never seen before. We'll never see again. We're so thankful, Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we know that there's been burdens, there's been problems in our lives, but you always there, always there with open arms. All we have to do is pray and ask you, ask you for forgiveness and to lead us in the right direction. We thank you, oh Heavenly Father. Thankful for your son, Jesus, who came into this world. He gave his life so that we might have this right to say, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It comforts us when we're all alone. When we need that comfort, mm -hmm. it's always there. He's always there, oh, Heavenly Father. And thank you. Thank you, dear Lord. You've been just so gracious to us. We don't even know how to begin to thank you. Thank you for the wonders that you've given in our lives. And Heavenly Father, we ask you just to be with us. Be with us, take care of us. Bless us this night, dear Lord, as we come here for prayer. We come here to listen to understanding, and we come here to learn more about you and your holy word. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, to be with us. Be with our pastor. Bless him, O oh Lord, and keep him. Bless his heavenly, O oh Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name. And then, Heavenly Father, bless all that's here. Bless all that's listening, O oh Heavenly Father, that's tuned in to us and want to hear the word also. We're asking you in Jesus' name. We ask you for your blessings. We call upon you, O oh Heavenly Father, because we know no one else to call upon. You are the only one that we have, dear Lord, and we come before you. We come before you just as humble as we know how <laughs> to ask you, ask you, just send your blessings down on us. Keep us, O oh Lord. Bless this church, O oh Heavenly Father. Yes. Bless us as we enter these doors, dear yes. Lord. Bless us. Send members, O oh Heavenly Father. Send people to come and say, <laughs> I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to find God in my life. I need Jesus close to me. I need the Holy Spirit for a comforter. We ask you in Jesus' name. And then, Heavenly Father, be with us. Guide us and lead us this, this night. Take care of us, O oh Heavenly Father. And as we leave this place, O oh Lord, be beside us. Take us safely where we have to go, Heavenly Father. We ask you in Jesus' name. We ask and we pray. All these blessings at the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, 
be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. And praise God. here tonight, we are less than two weeks away from what many people are considering one of the most important elections. I say in recent history, but there are those who say this could be very well one of the most important elections in the history of our nation. But I have an issue with what's going on during this election season. There are too many people who basically seek to demonize others who do not share their political views. And I've also noticed that even religious leaders have questioned the faith of candidates who they don't agree with politically. Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 13 state, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Yes. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Yes. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord yes, shall be saved. Amen. So that lets us know that salvation is not based on political affiliation. If I may go back into what Romans says, there is no difference between Jew and Greek. In this political season, there is no difference in Republican and Democrat. I'm, I'm talking about when it comes to salvation now. There's no Republican or Democrat. There's not going to be a Republican heaven and a Democrat heaven. There's going to be a heaven for those who have confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in their heart that God raised him from the dead. So our salvation is not based on our political affiliation. It's based upon faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ crucified, Jesus Christ resurrected, and one day he's coming back. Yes. Although our faith may affect our political affiliation, we should not define someone's faith simply because of which political party they're affiliated with. We may agree to disagree, but that does not mean that we can condemn a person's eternal soul based upon their political beliefs. So I ask the question, should quick Christians be involved in the political process? What if we should be involved in the political process. We're blessed to live in a nation where we can actually participate in the political process. Not everybody has that opportunity. And if we're not careful, everybody here won't have that opportunity. But again, I'm trying not to get too political here, but I just want us to look at what the Bible tells us about a Christian's civic duty from a biblical perspective. Now, as we're going through these texts tonight, I want you to keep in mind that these texts were written at a time that Christians were being persecuted by the authorities. 
So we're going to look at Paul's writing to the church at Rome and to his son in the ministry, Timothy, and we're going to look at the writing of Peter. So we'll begin with Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. That's a lot to deal with. Yes, it is. The church is being persecuted by the government. Mm -hmm. But yet Paul writes to the church and says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are Now, how many of us really believe that when we look in Washington, D.C.? How many of us really believe that when we look in Baton Rouge? How many of us really believe that when we look in City Hall? That all the powers are, are ordained. To be honest. When we look at some of the things that are going on, it's hard. it's hard for us to say that we agree with what Paul is saying. Well, maybe Paul just meant it then and it doesn't apply now. But is there anything that happens in the entire universe that God didn't know about? Is anybody in the office that took God by surprise. Mm. No. He did not surprise him. Some folks, what, Sister Brown, I didn't mean to cut you off. He did already know. We cannot, it's nothing that we surprise God when God already knows. He already knows us. So we can't nothing to surprise him. We think, but it's, no, a lot of people say, well, I do this and I think about it, but no. There is nothing that surprises God that he already knows. We might think that he don't know. We think, or we think we know. Yeah, but think he don't know. We think that we're going to make a decision uh, on November 5th that's going to take God by surprise. Hmm. No, we already know. The Alpha and the Omega, the, the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. He's already at the end from the beginning, so it's not going to surprise him what happened. So he is allowing whoever to be in power. If we look back in the Old Testament, he raised up some good kings. Yes, some bad kings. There was a bad king. He used the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. He used the 
her. He used all these folks. But the only reason they were able to do anything Well, let's understand, even though we might not agree with who's in power, mm. the only way they get there, even though and in America it's really difficult for us to grasp this concept, because we're used to being a democracy. Mm. Okay, I, now I'm not going to get into the whole subject of the Electoral College, we're, we're not going to do that tonight. But we have to understand that God is in control. Because verse 2 says, if we resist the power, we resist the ordinance of God. Mm. Well, let's just go ahead and press through this. The rulers are not a terror to good work, but to evil. Verse 4 says that those who are in power, now, now here we're going to really struggle with this one. Those who are in power are the ministers of God for the good. You mean the folk who have been elected and they're trying to take away rights from certain people? We live in an age where there is such a thing as police brutality. It can be challenging for us to wrap our brains around the concept of being subject to the power, especially when, as I said, we don't agree with them. Mm. But as believers, it is our duty to obey the law, but yet, because we obey the law, that doesn't mean that we disobey God. Mm. Now that's the thing we have to understand. The Bible says be subject to the higher powers. But why was the church being persecuted? Because the higher power says you can't go around talking about this Jesus person. But that did not stop them from talking about Jesus. So you see, sometimes being subject to the higher powers means that even for your faith, you will be persecuted. So, yes, we have some people who are trying to change certain laws and make it to be set up to where Christians are protected. And we know how much resistance that's needed. But we need to understand, we are not exempt from the law of the land, even if it means our Christian beliefs go against the law of the land, we still have to be ready to accept the consequences when our beliefs go against the law of the land. That happened to the church back then and keep on living and keep on being a Christian in this world. One day we're going to find ourselves in this very same position. Yeah. Am I going to obey man or am I going to obey God? When obeying man is in line with obeying God, that's wonderful. But we are not to do it in such a way that we are disrespectful to those in authority. Looks like he even talked about paying taxes in here. Verses 6 and 7. I'm a Christian, so... April 15th. <laughs> I'm going to give my money to my church mm. and I don't have to pay the government. Mm. I wouldn't advise anybody to try that. Because we can't claim that the Bible exists. And even when Jesus walked there, what happened? Give Caesar what is Caesar. Render unto God. So paying taxes and paying tithes aren't mutually exclusive. 
And let me not even get on the subject of the question, well, should I should I tithe on my tax refund? That's not where I'm going with that. <laughs> I haven't gotten a refund in so long, so I haven't had to deal with that. But, <laughs> but I'm still getting money. But understand that we as Christians, we're living on this earth. We are under the authority of government. This government is not in place without God knowing that this government is in place. Yeah. So regardless of the outcome of the election, whether the person we vote for wins or not, that person is still in authority. Yes, ma'am. I would like to say that uh, I think that one of the reasons why we as believers get in the uproar about political things, and I see it all over Facebook and I see my friends on Facebook, and some of them are making ugly comments or sharing those memes. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I want to respond to it, but then the Holy Spirit won't let me do it. But I think that the problem is that we don't pray, as the Bible tells us to pray for our leadership. And it, it, we can tell we don't pray because of the things we say and how we act behind the political stuff. Mm -hmm. If we pray, then God will open our eyes to see the bigger picture of what's happening, not only in this in politics, but the bigger picture of how you bring in the end times to fruition. And all of this can play a part. I know it's a different subject to talk about, but this all works up to it's what's going to happen later. You know, and we have to have a bigger picture of what it is. Even though I have my preference, you know, for many reasons, and some of those reasons are not as godly, but it's still a bigger picture to political. And the church is, is commanded to pray, and we're not praying. And I can, I'm first to confess I don't pray enough about politics or pray enough about my decisions and and study the what it is that we're voting for. There's going to be some evil on both sides, but we have to choose the lesser of the two and, and, uh, and pray about what God is leading us, what do we believe in. You know, there's going to be issues on both sides we don't agree with. But we vote, of course, because people shed blood, number one, for us to do it. And plus, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to have a part, you know, to be able to be in a country where we can vote. Yes, and that, that is something, uh, one of the things that you pointed out. I mean, if we expect... <coughs> America to be the Christian nation that some people are envisioning it to be. Scripture doesn't indicate that we're going to have this peace, not on this side mm -hmm. of the rapture. There are things that are going to happen and anyone who has a, an inkling of knowledge about the end times sees that things are being fulfilled on a daily basis. Yeah. So yes, when I look at what's going on in the world of politics, like Sister Erica said, we have to look at the bigger picture of what's going on. And instead of, I mean, the enemy wants the church to be <coughs> focused on the temporal. We should not be focused simply on getting people to the polls we should be focused on their soul. Right. Mm -hmm. We should be concerned about getting people ready to meet Jesus. Yeah. But as long as we can get caught up in the fray of what's going on in the political arena and neglect to pray as God has called us to pray, we can get off topic. Mm -hmm. And as, as spiritual leaders, those who are in positions of Spiritual leadership have to be careful about how they participate in the political process. Now, as African Americans, we know that where, where, where were our leaders coming from during the times of the Civil Rights Movement and when we were, we, as a matter of fact, we were kind of better off then because the movement was began by those who were in the church. 
We were more church oriented. We were more community oriented. Yeah. And Dr. King did not simply use the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and he did use those, but he also appealed to what we all have in common as human beings, yeah. that we're all children. We've lost that. Oh, it's a brown. in the church. And I'm not talking about the electoral policy. In the church. Well, Sister Mary said, I'm sorry. I want to add to what she said about everybody doing their own thing. And it's something I think about quite often is the fact of the distractions that we have. You know, the world now where we live in, especially in Louisiana, the distraction we have to, to work to work hard, to stay busy, because if you don't work, you don't eat here, you know, um, you really do have to work, and some people work in two or three jobs, and they're so tired that they don't have time to spend with God, to hear from God, I've, I've been there, so I know, and so being distracted, you know, we don't think that missing church, or missing Bible study, or missing prayer time with God hurts us, but it does, and, you know, we can go, and the more you stay away, or we stay away, the more easier it becomes to do that and begin to connect with God to hear from Him. So you can hear from Him on everything, you know, on all the all the issues of life, all the wisdom that the Bible said that Jesus has all wisdom. And so we don't get that if we're not with Him, if we're not fellowshipping. And so distraction and having our own life and doing our own thing pulls us away from God, pulls us away from hearing Him. And I, I know from experience, so that's what I can say, you know. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think back to the 60s and 70s when King was speaking and we were younger people. We, we are, as a people then, were more solid. We were a solid people and we were, were more unified mm -hmm. because the church was the nucleus of our community. Mm -hmm. He kept us involved and informed through the church. Oh, yeah. And I can recall going to meetings when we had to sleep on the pews because they stayed there talking so late at night, you know, and it was hot. The wind, we didn't have air and all this kind of stuff. The windows were down and it was hot in the church. But that's how they kept us informed. Mm -hmm. That's how they formed boycotts. Yeah. That's how they kept us active in being able to make, you know, new laws and stuff for the community and for our people right. because we stay connected to the church. Mm -hmm. And he kept us involved through the church. And nowadays you have so, you know, people who have fallen away from the church. So therefore, there goes our community. There go our neighborhoods. There go our people, our culture, and everything else from, you know, all over the country. And in some states, it is harder to make a living than others. You hear the governor saying, well, we're going to bring jobs to Louisiana and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, when you live in places where, like I said, Indiana is a working state. And they literally mean that because there's a warehouse on every corner. Mm -hmm. And I come from an industrial area where, you know, I know how to drive forklifts and all that kind of stuff. Right. So there are jobs everywhere you look. And then when you come to somewhere down here where they make it hard, this is more of a retirement state right. than, there, than it is a working right. state. It's yeah. very hard to make a living. Yeah. And, you know, you hear them say things. And you want to believe it. Yeah, that's true. They are going to, you know, bring jobs. But you like, when? When are they going to bring them? <laughs> you know? And, you know, it's stuff like that when you hear politicians make, you know, promises and what have you. But it's up to us as a people to come back to the church. That's right. Because, you know, they want to say church and politics don't mix. 
That's a lie. The devil is a lie. When the politics begin to infringe on the church, when they get to the point where they're telling us where, you know, men can sleep with men, and we, we have to decide the gender, you know, they can decide the gender of our children and what have you, they're infringing on the church then. So it's time for us to stand up and make the decisions for ourselves.
But we need to understand that Dr. King worked from the, not only from the church, but he also managed to work from the inside of those who were in authority. Because when he was able to get with the presidents, when he was able to get with the civic leaders and get them on board, he and the others who were in the movement, they understood. Now, they didn't, you know, we know not everybody in that day had the same philosophy as Dr. King did. Right. But when we do it God's way, mm -hmm. you have the enemy fighting against the enemy, a house divided against itself. So, so we need to, as we navigate through the current, I know, that, oh, well, it's a different time now. Different time, but it's the same God. Can I get a witness? Yeah. So we need to depend on him. So the next scripture we're going to look at is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Sister Erica, I specifically want you to read that one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, okay. verses 1 through 4. And when you start reading, you're going to see why I ask you to read. Okay. Based upon your first comment. 1 through 4. Okay. It says, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. I'm reading from NIV. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So the reason I said, Sister Erica, I want you to read that because her first set of comments said we need to do what? Pray. Like, okay, she got into the text already for what's coming up next. So when Paul's writing to Timothy, he says that petitions, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And then he says, especially for those who are in authority. In godliness and holiness. Mm. And my mind goes back to 2008, 2009. And you could hardly go to. Nah, okay, I started, but I'm going to finish it. You could hardly go to a black Baptist church without hearing somebody praying for President Obama by name. Mm -hmm. But then 2016 came around. 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. How many churches could black Baptist churches could we go to? Mm -hmm. And hear that same fervent prayer that was made for Obama being made for Trump. Mm. Mm. But what does the Bible say? And as a matter of fact, can I just say what I feel here? Can I just say what I feel here? If you don't like who's in office, that's more of a reason to pray for them. If you don't think they're doing the right thing, that's more of a reason. To pray for kings and for all that are in authority, that you may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness and honesty. For all. For all. So regardless of who is in the White House, regardless of who is in the governor's mansion, regardless of who is in City Hall, we should pray for them. And if we're going to pray for the candidate we voted for by name, if they win, we should also pray for the one who we didn't vote for if they should win. Because as believers, we are called to pray. 
Because there are plenty of folks who ain't praying. And some of them ain't even praying for themselves. Some of them don't understand that they're in the position that they're in because God ordained it. They think it's because of all the hard work they did campaign and all the money that they spent, all the speeches that they made, all the lies that they told. <laughs> behave, behave, behave. <sighs> this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So the Christian civic duty is to pray for those in authority in the process of praying for them. If they aren't saved, then we pray that they will be saved. If they're saved already, we pray that they can do something while they're in authority to advance the kingdom of God. Right. Now again, I know some people aren't going to agree with that. America is not a Christian nation. We're, we're not going to listen to the American Christian Taliban. I believe that America's in the condition that it's in because the church got too comfortable. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to play catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, salvation of souls and people coming into the knowledge of the truth. Not the Republican truth, not the Democrat truth, not any other party truth, but the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And he also said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So it doesn't matter who's in the White House. If we don't know the truth, then we will not be So in this season where we're praying to God to direct our minds and the minds of those who are going to the polls, we also want to be praying for their salvation and their knowledge of the truth. Yes. Sister Pam, did you have? I do because I'm thinking about, you know, as I pray with them and I talk to lots of people, you know, and many people say, well, you know, Because I, I talk to Nigerian people, you know, Indian people and everything. They say because in India or in Africa, if you try to live a gay or homosexual life, they would kill you. Mm -hmm. But if you come to America, you can live the way that you want to live. And this is supposed to be a Christian nation. But they say, yet still, you all are so hypocritical about, you know, the way that you live your Christian life. Because you think about compared to Muslims, they pray three to six times a day. And then they turn around and look at you all who right. say that you love your God so much, you know, and they don't see you pray at all, and yet still you're blessed, you know, mouthfully. And they say they are angry with you all because of that. And I'm like, well, I can understand both perspectives because, I mean, that that they're saying is, 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 is not like it's a lie mm -hmm. when you see how some of us live. And then we do everything but, you know, shoot our finger up to, to the sky. When the Lord calls us down, you know, calls us about it. I'm like, it's wrong. Not all Christians live like that. But yet and still, the ones that they glamorize and that they proliferate across the world are those that live, you know, in opposition to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, that's why, you know, many people want to come to America because it's free. We can live like we want to live here. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, you know. But America is a Christian nation. If we're supposed to be. But uh, I'm making the camera work difficult tonight. But the key is those who are supposed to be the Christian leaders are they accurately reflecting the truth of Christ? Because we can be here in Smithville living a life for Jesus. Souls are being saved. But we ain't on TV. Oh, I know. We're on Facebook Live. Thank you for those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. 
But Good Hope ain't going to be on NBC Nightly News. You're not going to see us on Fox, CBS, ABC. It's the people who get the exposure that are shaping people's concept of what American Christianity is. As a matter of fact, sometimes I ask myself the question. If first century Christians would come to America today, would they even recognize what we call Christianity as Christianity? Make time for what's important to us. How many of us make time for what's important to us? I mean, think about it. Well, I just don't have enough time to do whatever. I can't take time off work. I'm too busy to go to work, but then something happens, and what do we do? We find time to take off work. 
If I don't have enough leave time, oh well, I have to take off because what I need to do is more important to me at that moment. We make time for what's important to us. Sister Mary, Sister Phyllis? But, but we know that the times are different from when, when I was coming up, for instance. We didn't have television, telephone, just just nothing, but we went to church, and that was about the size of it. But nowadays, kids on TikTok. <coughs> what, what you put your kids down at night? Oh, God, sitting there watching TikTok. Mm -hmm. They're dancing on TikTok. They're on Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's just a different generation. And the parents, and most of the parents, are not trying to stop the kids to make them come. I got a little great nephew that was baptized, right? Can pastor baptized. He's got a room set up with nothing but computers all around his room, and he sits in his room all day. He can't even come out of his room to hardly eat when he's watching these computers and looking at everything, playing these games. But the parents have to step in and take control of the children. Now that's that's my feelings about it because the children they don't know better. That's what, I, that's what I'm supposed to do. But they should, they should bring their children to church just like they did back in olden times. But how can they do that when they're out doing something that's different? They, they're not coming to church themselves. Amen. And some people give the computers to keep them busy. Yes, they do. Yes, yes. yes. My grandkids. That's right. Them. That's right. Yeah. They, they have computers to give to them. them. Responsibility to pray for all those who are in authority. I wanted to say, Sister Mary had mentioned about uh, back in the day how the leaders were uh, back in the day. That, you know. But I do want to say, I thought about the fact that we have grown as far as like learning more about grace. I, and I know this is kind of like a side note, but it's just something I thought about because back in the day, there were some graceless preachers. <laughs> I mean, but you know, because God grow you from glory to glory, so you have, we've learned more, you know, about God in this day and time. Thank God. We, we, we know more about grace today, you know, versus back in the day where that was it. If you, you know, you, everything you're going to hell for, you know. I'm just, I just had to put that out there because I thought about that when we were talking about back in the day. When the ministers were really preaching, you know, fire and were children. Yeah, fire and yeah, they were preaching. We still need some fire and grace on preaching. Yeah. We still need some of it because yeah. some people get carried away when they hear about grace. Well, that means I can do what I want to do. God will forgive me. That that we've gone to the pendulum sometimes swings a little too far on that. A wife and girlfriend and a boyfriend. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Let, let, let me not get too far off track. It's your thing. Do what you want. <laughs> okay. The last scripture we're going to look at tonight is 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going in verses 13 through 17. I know I have 13 through 15 listed, but we're going to do 13 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto the governors, and unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well doing, ye may put the silence to ignorance and foolishness, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Okay. So we should submit ourselves to authority. And what authority should we submit ourselves to first? First, we should submit ourselves to God's authority. Remember, we're looking at a Christian civic duty from a biblical perspective. Everything that we're reading was written to the church. So there, there, are, there are things that we as believers have to do with these people before they receive these letters. They received Christ. So they already had a a biblical, a Christian mindset. So keep that. We submit to the authority of God. And then the authority of God to which we submitted directs how we submit to the authority that God has set up in the earth. And he said that, again, when I look at verse 14, sometimes we question that based upon what we see today. Because the authorities are supposed to be punishing the evildoers and and uh, praising those that do well. But sometimes it looks like those who are in authority are doing the exact opposite. Those who do evil seem to be getting ahead and those who do good seem to be falling behind. But that is not a godly authority that has been set up. Godly authority... But see, you know, again, being a democracy, we think that, you know, things should operate a certain way. Because, you know, and there are some people, when they get in a position of authority, they abuse the authority that they have been given. But we have to be mindful how we re uh, react to the abuse of authority. Which is better? The jailhouse or the graveyard? Sometimes we need to live to fight another day. You know. For <laughs> real. I, I, I had no I had no intention of saying that, but it just came up. Sometimes it's better. You know that the officer pulled you over without cause, but instead of trying to brace up on the one who has a gun and all you have are your fists. You already know he has an attitude. We need to teach our young men that they don't have to win. Right, make it home. That's right. Live or uh, now, what movie was that? Uh, it was Ice Cube and John Witherspoon, uh, and he told them fight with. Uh, 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 Friday after this. No. It was, yeah, it was, it was uh, Friday. Uh, one of the Friday movies. The first, when he wanted to, he wanted to be bad and you know use a gun, and and his daddy told him to use these. But what's better, even better than using these is using this. Because once that you can't take the bullet back once it's out of the chamber. Sometimes it's better and. And I, again, I know that there are people out there who are not doing the right thing. But I, I recall 
there have been there are two instances where I got pulled over that that come to mind with me when I, the day of my graduation from Grambling. Coming from Grambling, went through Winfield, got on this side of Winfield, and a state trooper pulled us over. I was driving. So he asked me to get out of the car, which I did. And I'm walking towards his, you know, the police vehicle, and we're talking. My father got out of the car with my diploma. He was going to show me, you know, we just came out. The officer very sternly told my father, get back in the car. My father turned around and got back in the car. And he's, of course, observing what's going on. And the next thing, he sees the state trooper and I laughing and talking. As it turned out, the state trooper grew up in Pineville. Mm. So we're talking about the fact that we're from Pineville. And he let me go with a warrant. What if I had an attitude with it? That could have gone a lot different. And another time, right here in town, I was going, going to lunch. And I, I was coming from Pinecrest, and I turned by Walgreens to go. Y'all know the rest. But anyway. So... <coughs> And that light, anybody who knows about the corner of Military Highway and 165 trying to turn left, that that light is a nightmare at lunchtime and at shift change time. It, so, yeah, the light was yellow when I started to make the turn. But apparently I didn't get through the light while it was still yellow. So I'm driving along, I'm on I just walk through Wednesday, I'm on my way. And I, until, I didn't notice that the blue lights behind me until I got to Burger King. So I just pulled into the Burger King parking lot. Stopped, the officer got out. Told me that I had basically run the red light. Okay. I wasn't arguing with him. I, mean, I thought it was yellow, but okay. So he writes a ticket. He gives me the ticket. He says, I delayed the date on the ticket. So if you know the district attorney or anybody in the district attorney's office, this will give you enough time to go to the district attorney um, and get this. 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 Mm. That's a lot of hmm. yep. And The trooper didn't look like me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was about to say something that I had no business saying. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for pride in my tongue. But he didn't look like me. But because I came to him in a respectful way, mm -hmm. then he's like, well, let me see how I can make this not so painful. Now, am I saying that every state trooper would have done that? Absolutely not. Some of them just don't care. But don't test that. Respect the authority. Verse 15 is important. Verse 15 says, when you do what you're supposed to do, it's the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Mm. There are some folk who just have this preconceived notion of how certain of us are going to act. Mm. The best way that we can silence that foolishness is not by not acting the way they think we're going to act. Then you can think, oh, you're different. You're not like the rest of them. That gets on my nerves when I hear that. I'm not so unlike the rest of them. Who have you been coming in contact with? Oh, excuse me. I digress. Make sure y'all stay on the main highways. Be 
you know, all crosses that you see in cities don't mean Jesus. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm just being honest from experience. Mm -hmm. And my kids are like, if your children have never experienced certain behaviors from certain people, they don't understand what you're talking about. Right. Until you break it down to them. And even those that have perpetrated those behaviors will sit there and laugh at you as if you're lying. Because I've had some co-workers recently, I told them, you know, when I left here in 77, I had lived down here in 47 years. But when we left here in 77, the Klan were standing out there in front of Jones Street and over here at AJ8 where we couldn't go to school. And we had to stay home for an entire week until all that cleared up. And then our parents sent us to school, you know, the following <laughs> week. They're like, well, were y'all afraid? We were little kids. <laughs> you think we will never forget that? That traumatizes you. So you have to teach your kids, you know, when you see people do certain things, don't flare up and become belligerent mm -hmm. or what have you. Keep your head on straight and remember what we've taught you. And we've only taught you this because this is what God has taught us. It, it takes the love of God to be able to know how to behave and to demonstrate peacefully. Mm -hmm. And that came from being in the church and from King and them teaching us. We might not be out of, we might be out of the 60s, but the 60s ain't out of everybody. Amen. <laughs> Respecting authority, and I think that sometimes we look at, you know, when people say, well, I'm not, they, they put their pants on just like I put my pants on. But it's not not the person that, per se, you respect is the authority. And the authority is not that person. The authority, the authority is really God. So if you respect the authority, if you think of it as I'm respecting God and I'm doing what God says, then that makes it different than you you saying this person is a, is a young lady or a young man and put their pants on just like I do. You know, that way, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, thinking of, of it the correct way. The authority. Uh, I remember Pastor Simon used to say it this way. Respect the position. Sometimes, in all honesty, we don't care for the person who's in the position. Sometimes the person in the position may not even earn our respect. Respect the position. Respect the authority. And, you know, we've been talking about this from the political realm. Again, with everything that's going on. There are going to be some people who are happy with the results of the election. There are going to be some people who are unhappy with the results of the election. But that, no matter what the results are, shouldn't cause us to get out of character. Our Christian civic responsibility, first and foremost, is to pray. To live a quiet and a peaceable life. To live a life, well, yes, you might disagree with the views that I have politically, but I'm not going to stop speaking to you because of your political views. We'll agree to disagree. We have a responsibility to include God in the process as believers. So again, this started with, because again, this is probably the worst political environment I've seen in my lifetime. Sometimes I think we're almost as bad off as the Civil War time as far as the division in the country. But as Christians, let us do our part. Not to try to convince somebody that the right way is to be a Republican, not to convince them that the right way is to be a Democrat, but the right way is to put Jesus in. Amen. Let God be true in everything. <laughs> Again, we talked about so that people will be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So that's our responsibility in the process is to not let politics cause us to act like we're 
in the world. We're in the world, we're not. So sometimes when it comes to these political campaigns, you can't tell the difference. And if I, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a moment, we were talking about authority in the political realm. Why is it that people have no problem with authority out there, but then they come in here and have a problem with authority? I know that there's a chain of command on my job, And I can't just go to my job and do whatever I want to do. I have a position. I have an assignment. And if I want to deviate from that, I don't just deviate from it, but I go to my supervisor. But yet, when we get to the church, we say, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and I can do whatever I want, and nobody can tell me nothing. But with God, people do things because, or we do things because the Lord hasn't because done he hasn't things, not done yet. Or he may be doing it and we just don't see it yet. We don't see it. We're talking about blessings by doing stuff that we, we should know. That they think God don't see. You think? You think God the Lord know my heart. Yes, he does. <laughs> he knows my heart. He knows what my motivation is when I'm doing what I'm doing. I can't fool him and don't mess around and get around somebody anointed. <laughs> don't mess around and come in contact with somebody with a spirit of discernment. Amen. <laughs> the ultimate authority is God. Pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. I may not be happy with the outcome on November 5th, but what gives me comfort is that I know God is in control. Yes, yes. Whoever wins in November will not push Jesus off his throne. Amen. God will still be God. Jesus will still be Jesus. The Holy Ghost will still be the Holy Ghost, regardless of the outcome of the election. So our job is to pray and to live godly lives and try to get as many people to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives so that they can come into the knowledge of the truth. Is there anything else? A lot of my friends and I, when we tell each other, even though we don't agree with each other politically, <coughs> we're not going to fall out with each other because none of those candidates are going to come down here and help you change your tires. <laughs> I don't know if they're on the road. Or when you need somebody to come to your house and help you, they're not going to come and do that like we do for each other. So let's not let them interfere with you know, our relationship with each other. Thank you all for the usual lively discussion. And for those who listen to the lively discussion and take it all in, thank you too. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that, oh my goodness, I just shut down everything on my phone. We don't have any more comments do online, do we? Okay. And again, we are grateful for our virtual congregants. Thank you for sharing all tonight as well. So if all minds are clear, uh, Sister Erica, could you lead us in our closing prayer? Yes. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you so much, Lord, for this time that we've had tonight. A time of uh, encouragement, a time of enlightenment, a time of teaching, Father God. Help us, Father, to remember the things that we've learned tonight. Help us to practice your word and be prayerful about those that are in authority, Father God. And help us to be prayerful about all authority, Father. And help us, Father God, to, um, to be obedient to you, Father God. And Lord, lead us and guide us and uh, lead us by your spirit, Father God. Help us to be open to the, your direction, but help us to pray so that we can get your direction. Father, we pray tonight for um, the anniversary coming up on Sunday. We pray for safe travels for everyone who's coming in. And we pray, Father God, that you will have a time of celebration, Father God, a time of joy, a time of uh, just reflection, a time of honoring you and um, and how long you've kept this church, Father God. Father, we ask that you will individually decide that we want to walk with you and decide that we're going to walk in the spirit and decide that we're going to connect with each other and love one another, Father, like the church is supposed to. We pray for our pastor. We pray for our first lady. We pray for every ministry, Father God. We pray for growth. We pray, Heavenly Father, uh, that you'll keep us as we leave this place and that you'll bring us back together safely again. And we want to say thank you and give you all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, and on Saturday morning at 1030, we will be meeting here at the sanctuary to prepare to go out into the community. We will have uh, some uh, brown bag lunches for people in the community. So if uh, you haven't signed up already, you're available on Saturday. We will meet here at 1030. And then we will go through Smithville on this side, uh, pretty much from Brad Street to Gordon Street. And then we'll also go across the highway. Um, like, I can't remember all the names of those streets on that side. But uh, we're going to not just go out to pass out brown bag lunches, but we will also have uh, some tracks with information on how to get saved, uh, some, uh, some information uh, about the church. So, and we also want to be prepared to minister to people. We've gone out several times and ministered to people physical needs with, with food. Now, we are, we are going to go out and minister to their spiritual needs. So if someone, when, uh, when we go, if someone needs a word of prayer, we'll pray with them. If someone needs to be led to Christ, we're going to lead them to Christ. So it's not just about passing out the bag and telling them we're having a church anniversary on Sunday. We need you to come to church. Oh, it's more important that we need you to come to Jesus. And once you come to Jesus, if the Spirit leads you to good hope, then we'll be more than happy to have you. So that's going to be Saturday. We meet here at 1030. And then we will go out into the community uh, 11 to 1 to uh, share not only some sandwiches, but the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then at 2 o'clock on Saturday, we will have our celebration choir rehearsal. Uh, we had one Tuesday night. We had a, a good turnout for that. But uh, we will have our rehearsal with our guest director, Brother Patrick Anderson. That would be at 2 o'clock on Saturday. So if you would like to participate or you know somebody, share the, spread the word that anyone, it doesn't have to be someone who went to Good Hope, but anyone who would like to share with us in our celebration, we will be more than happy to have them to join in with us as we celebrate our church anniversary on Sunday at 2.30 p.m., with Pastor Terrence Webb and the New Kingdom Missionary Baptist Church of Alexandria. There's a lot going on in our congregation. We need, we have several members who are in need of prayer. I, if I start naming, I'm probably going to forget <coughs> somebody, but let us just be prayerful for our con congregation. Illness, bereavement, personal situations, let us just continue to be prayerful. That's all I have. God bless you and